we're probably going to start. So thank you very much, all of you, for, for being here this morning for, for this first panel. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, scaling biochar uh, to the gigaton, which is a kind of interesting challenge. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to be the moderator of, uh, of this panel. Um, my name is Axel Renault. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of a biochar company uh, called NetZero. Um, and I have the privilege to have a, an incredible set of professionals uh, with lots of experience in biochar and the usage of biochar. Um, so to, uh, to start uh, the intros, uh, we have Lucia. Um, she's uh, the recently appointed chair of IBI. Uh, IBI is the International Biochar Initiative. Um, and so one of the leading uh, organizations that uh, promotes biochar and has been promoting for a very long time. Uh, we have Hans Jorg. Uh, Hans Jorg is the chairman of the board of EBI, uh, so another uh, European-based uh, biochar association. Everyone will get the chance to introduce himself in detail. Um, we have Dominique Hélène uh, from Suez, uh, uh, is the uh, Carbon Solutions Director for uh, for Suez. Suez has been uh, recently entering um, massively the uh, biochar production business. Uh, we have Pierre Collet uh, from Quantis. Uh, Quantis is a consulting company focused on uh, helping companies decarbonize, and biochar is you know one of the things in the toolbox. Um, we have Margot, uh, last but not least, uh, from uh, Nespresso. Uh, Margot uh, is the manager of uh, sustainability and strategic planning and innovation uh, at Nespresso. And Nespresso has uh, been uh, testing biochar for many years and is uh, thinking about using it at larger scale in the uh, coffee supply chain. So it would be interesting also to hear about you know, concrete uh, use cases uh, of you know, once we get all this carbon, where, where do we put it and, and what do we do with it? So uh, we'll try to have a very interactive uh, session. Uh, a bit of intro from all the participants. Uh, then we have some topics that we think are relevant to discuss, so we'll discuss. And then a uh, uh, long part of the session will be Q&A, so uh, you know, get ready and, and prepare your questions. We'll be doing the panel in English, but uh, I think you can ask the questions in French. Uh, and there's simultaneous translation. I think you just need to wave and say which language so that the, the system can, uh, can switch. So without further ado, uh, maybe Lucia, you want to, to start? OK. Uh, bonjour. Bonjour à tout le monde. Merci beaucoup pour uh, Alex, uh, Axel, sorry, uh, for the invitation. And uh, I'm really grateful to be here this morning. I'm Lucia, I'm the chair of the uh, International Biochar Initiative. And uh, I started my journey on biochar uh, many years ago. Probably I can be considered another gen part of another generation because everything started in 2007 for me. Uh, when I met uh, a scientist, Johannes Lehmann, which you probably know, and uh, I met him in form of a paper that he published. And so I was kind of, oh, what's this biochar? Seems interesting. And at that time, nothing was there. Just few pioneers around just investigating on the soil properties of biochar. So we say, oh, yeah, I was working with some scientists, Italian scientists. And really, I was, oh, yes, let's do something. Let's try to understand better this technology. And so we decided that a good setting uh, to introduce biochar and systems around biochar was Africa, could be Africa, because they, they are supposed to have acidic soil. So, and we, we, we asked for some money for a grant. We wrote a grant to the European Commission, and it seems that they liked it. So everything started from there. And of course, the first years, it was a huge amount of huge mistakes. So it was making mistakes all the time, so quite frustrating. Uh, but very interesting because when you make mistakes, you learn. And it was so in another from another angle, uh, all of us did a huge learning exercise. And in the meantime, the research was advancing. 
So it turned out that uh, the European Commission was so nice to us that they decided to give us more money. So we, we went we, uh, with this activity, which was mainly capacity building and knowledge sharing, networking, this kind of stuff. And at one point, uh, I met Johannes Lehmann in person, and, um, and we were asked uh, by the World Bank to deliver a proof of concept on uh, biochar systems uh, tailored to smallholder farmers in rural areas of uh, Burundi. So I, and I started my journey in Burundi in 2018. And I joined the board of IBI in 2019, and I'm here, and I'm honored to serve this community. Um, as Axel said, um, IBI is a global platform to, uh, for networking uh, and uh, uh, developing education and standards and, uh, uh, I mean, um, to reach out all the, and to involve and to nourish the journeys of all the biocharmers around. And uh, uh, now IBI uh, involves uh, um, more than 600 members all over 70 countries. Uh, can you please? Yeah. yeah, it's not working. Okay, that's the distribution of IBI worldwide. And I'm really grateful to be here to represent my organization. Uh, if you have time, we have a booth here. I'm here with some colleagues. Uh, the vice chair of IBI, Heloise Buckland, uh, another board member, David Bloom, uh, sorry, David Wayne, and our executive director, Wendy Lou Maxel Barton. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Hans Jorg. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Hans Jorg Leichenmüller. I'm, um, my, my background is on, on solar energy. I was a solar entrepreneur in, um, in, in the solar industry um, with a company I started back in 20, 2005. So I, I went through the whole uh, exponential growth of the solar industry as an entrepreneur and I saw how markets behave that show exponential growth. Um, after that venture in solar, I uh, joined Biochar as an investor in a biochar trading and refinement company, Kabuna. Um, and then I realized that it's not really, I mean, it's also about the biochar, but, it's, but the, the most important element of biochar is the carbon removal aspect. And then I initiated the foundation of the uh, European Biochar Industry Consortium, which now, we started with seven companies, now we are 100 members um, and representing um, most of the European uh, companies active, commercially active uh, in biochar in Europe. And I see a lot of members here uh, of EBI. So um, then, sorry, one, one thing to add, um, since uh, I, I I, th there was an experience from the solar industry that when you want to grow an industry, you can't do that as a single company. It has to be an industry effort working together um, on shaping the, the messages towards politicians, towards investors. And this was my experience in solar and therefore I initiated uh, the EBI. Um, and then I also saw that it's very important to um, to to make a measurable, um, uh, or to make the carbon service being measurable, and therefore I also initiated and invested in um, the foundation of uh, Carbon Future, the leading MRV platform on quantification of carbon removal credits. Now, in EBI, next slide please. Uh, in EBI, we, we, are, we are now doing um, an activity we're surveying the production, cap the biochar production capacity in Europe. And we're doing that, we've done that for three years. I'm now currently in the stage of uh, making the new uh, report 2023-2024. We're always surveying what has been installed up until the last year and what will be or what is in planning to be installed in the coming year. And these are the numbers that I published in, uh, we, as EBI, we published that in March 2023. Um, and what we can see here is on the, on the left axis, you see the, uh, the 
cumulative installed production capacity and on the right axis there's the growth rate. And why growth rate? Growth rate is so important when it comes to leading this technology to climate relevance. We need to keep up with high growth rates, otherwise this whole exercise might be a nice business for some companies, but will never come to climate relevance unless we hold very high uh, growth rates. So uh, next click, please. You will see um, the, the, the projected, back in uh, March, the projected uh, growth rate, last three years growth rate was 68%. And now we took it in, a, in, a dis in an intense discussion with industrial players, how can this growth rate to uh, be uh, continued? And now you see here the historic growth rates. Now it's calculated in CO2, not anymore in tons of biochar. The conversion between is 2.8. And when we, um, when we want to get this whole thing climate relevant up until 2040, next slide please, next click please, will have to maintain a growth rate of 46%. And this is really challenging. This is the challenge that is in front of us. I have no doubt whatsoever that we can do a growth rate of 20%, 25%, maybe 30%, but we have to be very serious. If we want to become climate relevant, this is the average growth rate we need, 46%, and that gets us to 100 million tons. And 100 million tons is not gigatons. This is Europe only, so we have other places in the world, and we have companies that are very active on these uh, areas, and that's very important as well. But we have to be serious. We have to have very, very high growth rates. So thanks a lot. Thanks. That's it. That's inspiring. 46% growth rate target. Few industries can can sustain that. Uh, Dominique. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Bonjour, tout le monde. Uh, to give you a rest, I will switch in French just for your intro. I think it will be more acceptable for French speakers. So. Euh, donc Suez est une jeune start-up de 150 ans, vous la connaissez, vous la connaissez pour son expertise dans le domaine de l'eau et, et des déchets. Euh, ce que vous ne connaissez peut-être pas encore, c'est que euh, Suez devient une société nouvelle en 2022 parce que euh, son organisation, son actionnariat, son ambition a changé. Et notamment parmi ces changements, euh, la prise en compte des, des enjeux climatiques, la prise en, jeu, la prise en compte de, de l'enjeu carbone devient tout simplement un axe de développement pour notre entreprise. Tout simplement parce que nos clients euh, le demandent, parce que le, le climat nous l'impose, parce que la planète nous l'impose. Tu peux passer et donc, euh, nous, très clairement, pour aller dans le sens de ce que disait Work, euh, le sujet est massif. Euh, L'économie du carbone, euh, plutôt que de décarbonation, d'ailleurs, on préfère parler d'économie circulaire du carbone. Et le biochar fait partie probablement des solutions les plus prometteuses, les plus intéressantes. Euh, je crois qu'on aura l'occasion d'y revenir à, à, à mains aspects. Mais au-delà de du stockage du carbone, le biochar est avant tout un produit et un produit qui doit trouver effectivement sa finalité sur des marchés d'application. Et c'est la combinaison de ces deux euh, fonctions, finalement, à la fois stockage du carbone et capacité à apporter un certain nombre de services aux utilisateurs qui fait de cette solution l'une peut-être des solutions les plus prometteuses et en tout cas les plus intéressantes et qui a décidé euh, le groupe Suez euh, de, de s'y engager. Donc pour nous, la massification veut dire évidemment fabriquer, construire, exploiter des unités de grosse taille. Vous avez ici la première unité que nous sommes en train de finir de construire au Québec sur une ville qui s'appelle Port-Cartier, sur le bord du Saint-Laurent, un endroit charmant d'ailleurs. Et cette construction va se faire en deux phases. Une première phase qui va être mise en service en fin 2024 et qui va avoir une production de 10 000 tonnes par an de biochar. Et cette phase va être suivie d'une seconde phase, tout simplement de réplication x3 de cette capacité. Comme vous le voyez, comme vous le comprenez, nous sommes installés sur un site de production de Conex de Syrie. Donc c'est un, un partenaire forestier que nous avons associé dans cette affaire et qui produit effectivement ses résidus sur son site de Syrie. Cette Syrie, 
est une petite série à l'échelle du Québec. Elle traite à peu près 600 000 mètres cubes de boissier chaque année. Et donc, vous imaginez la quantité de résidus qu'elle fabrique. Et ce sont des résidus qui, historiquement, ont peut-être trouvé preneur, mais en tout cas, pour l'instant, n'ont pas euh, été valorisés soit sur un plan technique, soit sur un plan économique de façon soutenable. Et c'est pour cette raison que cette industrie nous a choisi pour euh, nous accueillir et dans un cadre très intégré de, de John Venture qui s'appelle Carbonity, avec évidemment un troisième partenaire très important qui est le fournisseur de la technologie, en l'occurrence RX Energy, qui est un stand ici, vous pourrez discuter avec eux. Eh bien, nous avons, euh, via cette John Venture, conçu ce, ce schéma et c'est un schéma que nous allons répliquer. Donc la logique de Suez, elle est tout simple, toute simple, c'est de définir des endroits dans le monde où il y a effectivement des résidus de biomasse issus d'une première, voire d'une deuxième transformation qui, localement, ne trouvent pas euh, d'intérêt à être convertis ou valorisés ou traités ou, 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 ou recyclés. Et dans ce cas-là, effectivement, la transformation biochar permet d'apporter euh, à la fois cette double valeur qu'on évoquait tout à l'heure, c'est-à-dire à la fois cette capacité de garder le carbone sous une forme stable et on en reparlera tout à l'heure, j'imagine, mais aussi de fournir localement un biochar, un produit physique qui lui offre également des opportunités de valorisation sur un plan purement économique, mais aussi également sur un plan climatique additionnel, puisque la plupart des usages de ce biochar conduisent à des réductions additionnelles de gaz à effet de serre selon les applications que l'on vise. Donc voilà, notre objectif, il est là et la massification est au rendez-vous chez nous. Thank you, Dominique. So switching back to, to English, uh, Pierre, I think yes. I have problems with... Okay. No, no is that okay? Okay, Thanks. great. Thanks. So uh, hi, my name is Pierre Collet. I'm working in a consulting company called Quantis. So we are experts in, let's say, environmental accounting globally, not only carbon, and biocharge is not only about carbon. Also, I think it is important to notice that about ecosystem services, about, let's say, nature at the broader, broader meaning. So Quantis, we are around 3,300 uh, consultants uh, working since 15 years in, well, helping companies to uh, operate with it what we call within what we call planetary boundaries. So it is about, of course, climate change, but not only about water, about plastic emission, about nature, um, and well, we can move to the next slide if. If it's okay, so we work in mainly three main areas. One uh, is more may maybe relevant for us here because we uh, of its strong links with uh, the agricultural uh, sector, but we are working so in the cosmetic sector, textile sector, and food and beverage sector. And you see that we are working with uh, some of the major players here uh, internationally. Uh, I, I must also uh, say that we have been uh, acquired by a small consulting company <laughs> recently called Boston Consulting Group, uh, so not that small at all. Uh, and so it's also helped us to leverage our expertise and to broad that at a higher scale, I would say. So how do we help those companies? Uh, so we can go to the, the next slide, please. Uh, we, we are helping them on, on several topics. Uh, so we are doing what we call product assessment, or more generically life cycle assessment. So you do assess uh, the environmental impact of a product, and you do compare that to other alternatives, and you try to, let's say, eco-design at scale or uh, things like that. We are also helping companies to assess their corporate footprint, and that's where we, we will see how uh, biochar technology, or more broadly carbon dioxide removal technology, can help to a company to reach their targets. Um, and so we are doing that in several, uh, let's say, environmental areas. It could be climate strategy projects, where we are strongly connected to main methodological frameworks like the GHG protocol, uh, SBTI, science-based target initiative. And we can discuss that a little bit uh, deeply after. Uh, but we are also doing that uh, on, on the other environmental issue, like the nature one with the SBTN, so science-based uh, nature, uh, science Based target, um, uh, I get a initiative. Yes, the SBTI, but the N is a network on nature. I don't remember. I got a blank here. Sorry, but well, we are helping companies to reach their target in several mental issues. That the key message in biochar will be and is one of the key um, factor of success when it comes to climate, but not only. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Pierre.
and Margot uh, as, you know, actor, uh, Nespresso, uh, we saw Nestle uh, as being part of Conti's portfolio, so Nespresso with hands-on experience. Yes, thank you. So maybe, uh, so everybody, hi, my name is Margot uh, Ross. Uh, I'm working in the sustainability team of uh, Nespresso. For the one that don't know, uh, Axel was mentioning Nestle because uh, Nestle is part, uh, Nespresso is part of the Nestle group. And we are working a lot with uh, Quanti, so I'm, I'm happy to see you today. Um, maybe before going into the detail of uh, biochar, I wanted to reconnect a bit with the big picture for you that you can understand why biochar could be so important for Nespresso. Uh, so at Nespresso, we have created what we call the positive cup, which is our CSV report. And through this positive cup, we believe that with a cup of coffee, we can get a positive impact on the environment. We have a path for this uh, that we articulate around five main axes. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. The first axis is the net zero one. Uh, we believe that to get a positive impact on the environment, the emission of Nespresso needs to be at net zero. So this is where we get uh, SBTI commitment by 2035 at the soonest. The second axis is on the regenerative coffee. So maybe for you to understand a bit how we're working at Nespresso, we don't own our own coffee farms, but we are working with the same farmers since more than 20 years. Why do we choose to work with the same farmers? Is because we set up and put in place together some sustainable agricultural practices to make sure that producing coffee, we protect the landscape, but we also protect the quality of the coffee to tackle the year to come in the climate change. The third angle is the communities. Uh, in sustainability, we believe that the coffee is as much important as the human working in those farms. So this is why we have a lot of program in place for the farmers, but also for their family, for the communities, with uh, one main focus on the living income. So important for us to diversify the income, but also to pay the fair price uh, for the coffee. The fourth angle is the circularity. So we want to make sure that the capsule that you have in your hands is collected and recycled as much as the coffee machine, uh, that uh, the Nespresso coffee machine that you could get at home. And the last one is uh, B Corp. I don't know if you all know what is B Corp, but it's a quite known uh, sustainable certification that is uh, quite difficult to get, especially for a big company. And we are really proud to be B Corp since uh, 2022. Now for you to make the link uh, with biochar, uh, the two main angles that are really linked with biochar, and I won't go in too much detail because this is the goal of the discussion after, uh, but for you to understand, the two main links for us is with the net zero. So as I say, we want to be net zero, and we really believe that biochar could be a, a big player here. So for the carbon sink part, but not only uh, we were, and we will talk about carbon credit, but for us it is also really important and even more important to reduce the carbon emission at the source itself or at the coffee. And Biochar should play a role there. And the second part is the regenerative coffee. Uh, so on four main axes, the first one is the soil health. The second one is the biodiversity. The third one is the uh, helping farmer to tackle the climate change uh, to, to come. And then the last one is the productivity uh, of the coffee plant itself. I think it was also really important for you to understand the big picture, to show those uh, graphs uh, that are quantified uh, in, the, in the figures that I'm showing on the screen. So you can see on the top of my head uh, that there is the full value chain of Nespresso with the uh, carbon emission linked to it. So this is coming from the green coffee supply until the usage of your capsule. The green coffee part is the big block here. This is representing a bit less than 40% of our emission at Nespresso. And this is why this is the main things that we need to tackle at least first if we want to reach net zero. We are actually applying right now with SBTI to make sure that we have a net zero coffee so the, for the green coffee part by even 2030. In the world, uh, to produce one kilo of green coffee, you emit about seven kilo of CO2. We are really proud to say that with all the practices, sustainable practices, 
we are putting in place since more than 20 years, you can see that the AAA coffee farms, so this is the Nespresso farmers, are already reaching half of this emission, so we are between 3 to 3.9. And we don't want to stop there. This is great, but this is not enough. If we want to be net zero, we really need to find some tools like uh, biochar to act as a carbon sink and reach the net zero for the coffee itself. And then the last slide before we can really jump uh, to biochar, uh, I want it also that you understand why it's so important for us to be net zero. In the, in the world, uh, the, as you understood, the green coffee for your cup of coffee is the most important part because it's um, about 40% of our emission. This also means that depending on the weight of coffee that you put into your coffee cup, the emission of your coffee cup at the end is not the same. To give you the comparison and why we do believe that at Nespresso we could offer to our uh, customer one of the main sustainable solutions, is really linked also to the system of Nespresso. If you compare a fully automatic machine, you put uh, to, to get a cup of coffee between, let's say, 12 to 15 grams of coffee in your cup of coffee. With the Nespresso original system, to get the same intensity in the cup, you will put only between four to six grams of coffee in your capsules. So as you understood, green coffee being a, a big element, this is really differential the, the weight of coffee that you have in your cup. Of course, this is also linked with the water usage of the machine, the energy consumption of your machine. But all of this is allowing us today, when we compare ourselves to a fully automatic machine, to say that the emission in your cup of coffee is about 23% less. So I hope this helps you to understand the, the big picture. And, uh, and now we can jump, I guess, into Bayeshar directly. Thank you. Thank you, Margot. Um, so we have a big topic in front of us. Uh, Hans Jörg was talking about this uh, incredible growth rate just to reach the hundreds of millions of tons. Uh, our panel talks about gigatons, so we are even more even more ambitious. Uh, just to set the stage, um, biochar today represents more than 85 percent of the carbon removal uh, done, you know, last year, as per you know recently published uh, statistics by CDR.FYI. Um, and so today, this is the leading solution for carbon removal. There are many others. We're not going to discuss, you know, direct air capture and hence weathering and, and all the likes. Uh, but, you know, we, f we feel there's really something for biochar because it's available, because it has huge potential, and because it generates lots of co-benefits, as very well illustrated by, uh, by Margot. So my, my first question to, to, to the panelists is, um, you know, what do you think is the long-term potential of, of biochar and as a, as a carbon removal solution? And where do you see the biggest potential in terms of you know, feedstock, geographies, application? Getting to a gigaton will not be a kind of one size, you know, just one solution to be deployed. Where do you see, the pot what is the potential and where do you see it? Maybe starting with you, uh, Lucia. Yes, thank you, Axel. Um, yeah, it's a big point. Uh, that's really a big point because, as you mentioned, uh, the biochar carbon removal are playing uh, an important role in the biochar for the biochar industry. But let me step back for a moment uh, just to uh, uh, and to have a common understand what we intend with biochar. Because uh, many times, uh, especially when we think about uh, the potential of biochar to generate removals and carbon sinks, uh, we, uh, we are focusing on biochar and we think it is a product, which is true. I mean, it is a product. But at the end of the day, uh, I think that product is not possible if we don't uh, consider biochar as a system. Okay, so let's wear these systemic glasses and think about biochar not only like, okay, I have my product there, what do I have to do with that, okay? But let's think about all the, the, the things that are, uh, we need to get biochar. Uh, so we start from uh, sustainable sourcing of biomass. Biomass needs to be sustainable, okay? This is a key point. Uh, we cannot do it in another way. And, uh, and of course, 
This will change a lot depending on where you're doing the things, where you're doing uh, your operations. If you are in an industrialized place or if you're not, uh, how is the setting that you're working? If this biomass is scattered around the landscape or if it is not, that makes a huge difference. So the biomass sourcing is the starting point to think about uh, biochar. And then, of course, uh, we need to go through a process to produce biochar, so uh, a plant uh, which ca can have different features. And we know that there are many uh, producers and industries here that are on this space of biochar production. And of course, this, this, is, this depends on the biomass uh, that you have. So, uh, how you frame the plant, how you design the plant, where you put the plant, uh, how you link the plant with other, I mean, agro-industries or, uh, I mean, the landscape that you have around. That makes a huge difference. And at the end of the day, we have the biochar. And the biochar can have so many uses, uh, and apart from uh, the, the, the carbon sink generation, biochar is, of course, used in the soil, but can be used in other ways, uh, as for water filtration, for materials, for asphalt, and a lot of many other uses. So please, consider biochar as a system. And when we have this system, we understand very well the circularity of this model, uh, which is really super nice. Uh, and you can understand very easily that a biochar system can be deployed in so many different ways. And that's a, a very nice part of the biochar uh, space, because you can have amazing uh, I mean, uh, operations with biochar, as we have heard here, as well as a small scale and little stuff. And it is biochar. And it is, uh, we are doing good things in both uh, in both ways so and, and i will come to the geographies now uh, <clears throat> because this is very important you know i mean uh, the biomass is distributed in a very um, different way <clears throat> around the globe and we all know that it's a kind of kind of stupid <laughs> consideration but uh, <clears throat> this means that there are potentials are not the same, are not equal all over the globe. So the latest uh, uh, research paper says that uh, if we consider biochar as a solution to offset CO2 emissions in one year, uh, biochar can more or less uh, be useful and be um, offset around 6% of the uh, global GHG emission, which is very nice to, to hear. Uh, but when we go and read a little bit more and to understand how this 6% is calculated, we see that there are a lot of differences between different countries. Of course, um, yeah, we did a general, this generalized framework to understand, uh, to understand this better. And uh, the largest uh, biochar bio carbon removal potential, uh, of course, is in the hands of few countries where they have uh, the larger population and where they have uh, the presence of important food industries. And I'm talking about China, the US, Brazil, India, Argentina, Indonesia. It's kind of obvious. But when we go to uh, the potential within each country, mm, uh, which is very interesting because each country, as you know, can claim for their uh, biochar carbon removal through Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, uh, then it's, it's very interesting because small countries can have uh, a, a benefit much more uh, than that. There are 28 countries with a percentage of uh, biochar, of the role of biochar, higher than 10%. Uh, they are small countries, so they cannot have that huge impact at global level, but they can do it. They can decide to do it. They can integrate uh, biochar as carbon removal option in their portfolio. So Eswatini, Malawi, Argentina, uh, Ghana, Hungary in Europe, uh, Croatia, Moldova, and Burundi. 
And in Europe, uh, we do have also France. It's well posi positioned <laughs> in our study. <laughs> uh, so it's really very interesting to see how far the countries can go uh, with biochar. Yeah, and I, I would point to the study that you were mentioning implicitly uh, by IBI uh, on the potential, uh, you know, and the geographical uh, potential of biochar. You can find this, this is a quite uh, interesting paper. Uh, maybe Hans Jorg, uh, building on that, you know, you've talked about, you know, the 100 million, uh, you know, that's for, for Europe. What's your view on the potential in, in Europe? And we talk about carbon removal. But biochar is also an, a way to generate energy, hence to avoid emissions. How, how do you see the link and how do you see the potential? Yeah, uh. yeah since, we, since we have to, um, to get these high growth rates to become climate relevant, it is very important to have business cases that, that offer to investors a good, a good return on invest. And that was in the solar industry one of the key metrics that helped to attain these high growth rates. So let's be not let's not be naive. If we if we do not offer good incentives to investors, the growth will just not happen. If we are not getting big companies in like Nestle or uh, uh, Suez, if we don't get these big companies interested in the in 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 biochar and in, in project development, it will just not happen fast enough. Just to give you one one number, what we saw, I, I, I showed the the roughly 100,000 tons production capacity in biochar from the numbers that were shown by Dominique. He said in the second phase, one plant alone will do 75,000 tons of CO2. So uh, just to put things into perspective, the 100, the 100 million tons are Europe alone and 2040. We can do a bit faster, maybe not much faster, but then we have to develop it into, I think in Europe, 500,000 is something that can be done. And that means worldwide, uh, it, it is certainly consistent with previous studies that worldwide we can do 2 million tons. But it, in order to Two get- 2 billion, not billion. Uh, sorry, is right, right. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry for that, yeah. Uh, gigaton. And, but in order to get there, it is very important that we harvest the energy benefit of production of biochar. If we don't do that, we w the business cases won't be juicy enough to, to realize the growth rates. So there's, uh, there's an energy linked business case. I think there's an agricultural link business case. Uh, Margot, you were uh, referring to also. So how do you see the link between, you know, the gigatons that we need to remove, uh, the emission we need to avoid uh, in, in agriculture, following a bit the uh, Nespresso model that you, you showed us before? So um, if I take back Lucia comments that I'm fully aligned with uh, um, in the fact that what is important for us at Nespresso is the full circularity of this business model. And everybody cannot afford, let's say, to do that. Uh, I can give you some other examples at Nestle in dairy where they are buying directly the biochar not produced from their own biomass. But let's say that at Nespresso, we are lucky enough to be able to put in place this kind of model. So meaning our farmers that would bring uh, the biomass and then they would buy the biochar and apply it directly to their soil. The, the, the constraint in the feedstock, because we are producing in more than 18 countries uh, the green coffee, is not that much for us in terms of geography, let's say, because they are, even if you are right with the constraint and the fact that we want it to be sustainable sourcing, you know, we don't want to create deforestation uh, coming with this great project. So, yes, there are some constraints behind, but we are also saying that um, th there are all types of biomass that you could find worldwide. For us, the geography is more linked to the usage. So if we want it to be economically viable, as you said, we need to make sure that we are using it in the right uh, landscape. And then for this, uh, we consider that tropical uh, countries like um, West Africa or Latin America are much more relevant in terms of soil because the soil is quite poor and acidic, and this is where, where we will see the real benefit of putting some biochar uh, into the soil. So yes, we see biochar and those old gigaton as carbon sequestration that are important, but mainly for us on helping to change the, 
the structure of the soil. I, I know that most of you probably know a lot uh, on, uh, on biochar, uh, but let's say that the, the fact that we could use it kind of as a sponge, you know, in the soil to keep the nutrients, uh, to, to keep the water into the soil. For us, this is really where we want to play and reduce the emission of coffee itself. Yeah, and I, I think it's quite interesting because we are starting to move, or to say that on top of removing, you know, there's emission avoidance through energy, there's emission avoidance through low usage of fertilizers, um, you know, without spoiling uh, numbers, but, you know, in coffee, you can get uh, by using biochar, you get a stronger reduction in terms of emission than carbon sequestration, and actually, of course, the two two combine. So, so quite uh, quite interesting. Um, maybe you know, taking a step back because here we now we we we're getting to uh, you know concrete applications, but more more globally, and maybe this question is for you, Dominique, because Suez has taken a kind of industrial approach to biochar, to biochar production, but then also you know usage. Where do you see the most promising applications? We've talked about agriculture. What are the others? Uh, how do you see agriculture? What are the others? And how is Suez thinking about it? Yes, it's a hard question. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, I just want to highlight some point because we, we spoke about biomass, we spoke about feedstock, we, we spoke about this, this thing. But of course, we need biomass to produce biochar, but we speak from the beginning from one biochar is not true. There are a lot of biochars, and the biochars will affect uh, the application, especially the value of the, of the product. So industrializing this uh, new industry needs, of course, to be very robust on the permanency of the product, on the carbon removal uh, trading, let's say. But trading the biochar, and the biochar with an S, will be, will be key. So depending on the biomass, depending on the process, depending on the technology operation, many biochars will be, will be produced in the future, probably at different cost, but with different value. And our target today is really to think about the markets with an S, which will be able to give the value, the necess necessary value of this product. And of course, agriculture will be uh, obviously one target, but in our mind, it's not, uh, it's not probably what we call the, the green crops uh, culture. It will be probably more high, highly specialized agriculture, uh, meaning horticulture, meaning flower production, meaning fruit production, any kind of cultivation which, which will be affected by the climate, for example, or will uh, provide a lot of value which can be spoiled uh, thanks uh, to, uh, let's say, perturbation of, of the climate. So we think that the biochar should be probably in the first phase as something, not a commodity, not yet, but probably a specialized amendment which will bring a special value for agriculture uh, players and things like that. But just to say that, you are right. We have many applications. And one, one application I, I like pr pretty well is uh, the application in, um, uh, let's say, the enteric methane emission reduction. Because uh, using biochar, when it is a good one, what is when it is a high quality, a premium quality biochar, you can use it in cattle feeding, especially for ruminant. And when you use a dosage very, very small, huh? we speak about 100. 200 grams per day per cow, you can expect to reduce the methane emission of these cows. And we know by, by, by essence, and it's very, uh, very well known in the information, that the dairy industry is very highly challenged due to this ruminant emission. And uh, this application is nice because you produce value for the farmers in using biochar because he's reduce, reducing the methane emission, so he can get some additional credit for that if the methodology exists. But the, the biochar will take place afterwards in the manual, and the manual will come back to the soil. And this kind of cascading effect is typically the kind of benefits that the biochar will provide in the future. And here you can add, let's say, some additional values, which at the end of the day, we, which make uh, the market. But for doing that, we need to be more demonstrative. We need to educate the market. We need to be more scientific based somewhere, because a lot of experience exists, but not much demonstration at scale. And we, we, we are keen, let's say, to have this science put it in place in order to, to, to demonstrate that, in order to demonstrate the value. And, um, and the value would be key at the end of the day. 
because 100% of the value of the bulk share will not come from a carbon credits, of course. And probably even if we need uh, $200 today uh, to, to per, per ton of CO2 to, to make this uh, business running, uh, in, in 2050, when uh, the, let's say the full target of neutrality will be gained, probably we will need to achieve and to reach, uh, let's say, more cheap solutions and probably at a low price. So it means that the market of the bulk share in the next decade and the next 20 years need to take value of that and we, may, we need also probably to produce the right products uh, of that. So this adequation between feedstock technology parameter and markets will be in our, in our, in our business very, very key in the future and we have to, to, to work together on that because it's a question of science, it's a question of regulation, it's a question of technology of course, uh, uh, choosing the right biomass, the right geography, but not only. If I may, I'll just add on uh, what you were uh, saying, uh, Dominique. Uh, yes, you're right that uh, there could be also other application um, than even the closed loop that seems to make sense, but um, a bit broader. Uh, and, and just to give you an example, what we are doing in uh, Nestle Dairy, so this is uh, not part of Nespresso program, but uh, uh, also the scalability could be quicker because, as we said, we need to prove the economic viability. And uh, we can see in some sectors that it will be quicker to prove than in others. And uh, we have a nice story uh, at Nestle itself, so that's why it was uh, important to reconnect with dairy, as you said. Uh, we have uh, one farmer in Switzerland that is, uh, you know, using his own manure, and his, in his, from his own manure, he was producing enough energy to supply um, the, the energy of around 80 houses around the farm. And since he put biochar in few months only, so this is where the economic viability is quick to prove, in few months only, the productivity of the manure increased so much that he was able to supply the energy to 110 houses around the farm. So th this is where it's good also to be able to prove quickly and not only wait for years, because in agriculture, sometimes it could take more time. So we, we, we're starting to touch around, you know, how do you decarbonize supply chains? Um, and there's typically the kind of in-supply chain usage of biochar we've discussed. There's also the outside of the supply chain more, okay, here is biochar for usage and here are carbon credits for offsetting, uh, you know, someone else's uh, activity. Um, question for you, Pierre, how, how do you see, um, you know, the, the development of biochar in this kind of two application in supply chain and beyond supply chain? And how does this fit with what SBTI is preaching, you know, and how should we think about it? Thanks. So I will, I will try to, to be concise around that because I, I can speak about that for ages, uh, I guess. But um, so basically, when, when you are assessing the corporate footprint of a company, you have different what we call scope of emission. So uh, sorry to go back to these basics, but that's relatively important to understand how you can use and leverage on biochar. So you have what we call scope one emissions. That's your direct emission. If you do produce, I don't know, automotive or whatever, that's a direct emission of your plant, your factory. You have what we call scope two emission, and that's mainly the electricity, uh, the emission from the electricity or steam that you are buying. And we have what we call scope three emission. And scope three emission are most of the time the most important one, and especially in the food and beef sectors or in the textile one. It represents more or less 90% of the emission. Those emissions are linked to the upstream, basically what you buy, what you need, to operate and uh, the use of what you are selling. So uh, sometimes we do see companies that are not including them because the use of those products have a lot of emission and you can think about, uh, follow what I am thinking about. But basically when you are food and beef sectors, the high share of your emission, we see that with Nespresso, it was 40% in the case of, of this bringing one coffee on the table. but at the corporate level, it would be 90% of your emission. And so we have now different methodological frameworks that states how you can reduce at which rhythm you should reduce your emission. When we are speaking about net zero target, like Nestle uh, is doing, we need to reduce by 2050, the latest, you need to reduce 90% of your absolute emission. 90% of your absolute emission compared to a baseline that is a baseline of today. 
In 2050, you need to in include the growth of, of your business. So you need to reduce, 90 per compared to the baseline of today, 90% of your emission in 2050. That's huge. I mean, that's absolutely huge. We are not speaking about incremental technology here. We are speaking about business model shifting. We are speaking about new way to operate. And within this space, um, you have several levels, of course. So you can supply your biomass more uh, sustainable in a more sustainable way. Um, and until recently, all the agricultural sector was a little bit left apart. And so recently in the SBTI, you do what we call the flag guidelines or forest land and agricultural guideline. And this is in, in this flags guideline, for the first time, a company can now, within its value chain, and it's super important, but within its value chain, take into account the removal of carbon um, in, in, in the field that they operate. So typically, Nespresso or Nestle can take into account the fact that they are remove carbon from the atmosphere into the calculation of their target and then be leveraged on this carbon dioxide removal technology to reach their target. And SBTI is like thousands of companies and the biggest one that are committed to reach those net zero or mid-term targets. So it's really a, a lever that is, is key. And another one, uh, still in this kind of climate operation, you, you need to reduce by 90%, but you also need to, what we call, neutralize those residual emissions. And to neutralize those residual emissions, you need to basically offset them with different kind of offsets technology and the one that are acceptable within the framework are the removal one. And so once again, we can go back to biochar here. So we do see how also the methodological landscape has evolved by taking into account the high potential and the high need of taking to the gigaton level those uh, removal technology. And uh, I think that we have some front leaders here, and that's super nice. Uh, but uh, and depending on the on the use case that we can have, we need to have more and more, uh, I would say, yeah, business companies that will rely on such technology. Great, thank th thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to move the, the the discussion on. You know, we're talking about you know the potential, the billion, million tons, billion tons the new business models, there's also a starting situation, you know, and, you know, hans Jorg, you showed a few statistics on, you know, what's been going on the last years. What's your assessment on the, uh, the, the state of the industry today, you know, where we are and what needs to change to get to, you know, the sustained 46% growth in Europe and the gigatons and, you know, basically making all the promises of biochar come true at scale? Yeah, thank you. Very, very good question. So we, we have today something like uh, 180 installations in Europe, biochar producing installations with more than 250 tons production. What we clearly see is from the market report that the average production capacity per installed unit is increasing significantly. It was kind of 300 tons. It moved over to five, 600 tons. Now the average is already at 700 tons um, of production capacity. So this is a clear trend to larger systems, which is also consistent with what you said. We have the, the need to cut down emissions by 90%. That only works with bioenergy, only together with bioenergy, this emission will be possible. And therefore, in order to have cost-efficient bioenergy and at the same time carbon removal, biochar carbon removal um, uh, activities, uh, larger systems helps. Then when we look at the industry from this, uh, these 180 systems, I would say 80% are um, provided from, let's say, five, six, seven, eight um, uh, of the leading equipment manufacturers. Um, the largest one have deployed something like 30 systems, 40 systems. Um, we, we will see two things, I, th I think. The, the number of um, equipment manufacturers will, will increase 
um, but we already have something like 20 equipment manufacturers in Europe, but still it will increase. But then there will be a point when there will be a consolidation um, of, um, of, of, of winning players, uh, but it will certainly not be one, two, three, or five equipment manufacturers only. We will certainly remain to have 10, 20 uh, relevant equipment manufacturers because biomass is very very different sizes of technologies is very different so there's a lot of space for specialized companies and and we'll see this just being professionalized and we see we will see big players entering the space uh, and then using um, cost reduction methodologies from uh, uh, from well experienced industries D Dominique, you you come from the you know the big industry. In your view, I mean, is it going to be a startup-led business? I'm just a bit provocative, you know, like maybe what we do. Is it going to be in the end a big company-led uh, activity, or is it going to be a mix of all of that, or does it depend on geographies? How how do you see the industry structure? Um, you know, five years, ten years from now. Uh, for sure, he, it has been started by startup, and I have the pleasure to think that uh, Suez is also a kind of startup somewhere. You mentioned that at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> now, yes, you, you must be pioneer and you must be visionary. Let's say to to let that and and all the job which has been done by the different players mentioned by Jan's work for Europe, for example, is, was brilliant because if we are here today, it's thanks to these pioneers and startups and entrepreneurs and things like that. So. Yes, we have to move, we have to move. Is there a place for different business models, different scale? Probably. Um, it's not our feeling because we, 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 where we are good is to, to build large plants and to, to build, uh, let's say, confident plants. And we know that we spoke about the, the credit carbon, but we, speak, we spoke about the quality of the biochar, but we have to speak also about the energy balance of that because probably it's not known for for some of you but when we produce biochar we have an excess of energy of syngas and this is gas syngas has value and we have to think about the way to manage this value and it will be probably a part of a significant value in the future of that so so we have three three things to to sell somewhere the carbon credits the biochar and the energy and it's a bioenergy it's a pure bioenergy so thinking big, it's a way to optimize that. Uh, thinking about the, the business for using the, the biochar think led us also to think big, because when we are speaking with big players, big corporates, which are thinking about using, uh, let's say, the biochar in their value chain, they need a standardized product. They need something which is TD from the first January to, to the end of the year. And um, if we want to make value of that, if we don't consider biochar as a fatal product, but uh, as a product on purpose, made for special usage, special functionality, and so on, we need to be steady, we need to be standardized, we need to be massive somewhere, and we, we, we need to be professional, of course, but we need also to have the right technology to do that at the right scale. So. Probably there are different markets, different places, different locations probably also, but our feeling is that if we want to play a role at one million ton plus of uh, CO2 removed in the future, in the next 10 years, we need to have also, let's say, um, a solid base for uh, pushing the biochars with an S in different markets in a standardized way. And doing that, we need big scale, of course, and um, it, will be, it will be our target today. If I may comment a bit, there's a bit of a paradox because we, you know, when you look at biochar and we've discussed, you know, all the wonderful properties, you say, okay, this is a great product, should be everywhere, and why don't we have more yet? And then we say, okay, we want, you know, we run some aggregate number and say, okay, gigatons, and then we say, okay, big things and, you know, big installations and so on. But then you bump into the problem. The biomass is not centralized. It's actually all over the place. And it's bulky, it's difficult to move around and so on. And so there's a bit of this tension between 
uh, you know, something that in theory can be big, where you would like to have big installations, but at the same time, you're bound by the super local uh, nature of, you know, where is the biomass and how to work with the supply chains. And I think that's the, the thing we're all trying to figure out, you know, um, where, how big, how decentralized, how to make it work. In the end, it's not going to be 10 mega biochar plants in the world, you know, doing the gigatons. Maybe it will be for DAC, but not for biochar. It will be hundreds of thousands of decentralized plants, and then you bump into, you know, this scale problem. But, but look, Axel, this is, I think, this is exactly the strength of biochar, because biomass is distributed, and there are very different kind of biochars and business cases, and that allows to scale biochar faster than if you had a technology that is a single horse trick thing. Biochar is not a single horse trick thing, and and therefore a uh, single trick horse. Let's <laughs> sorry. Um, we have. T the variety is the strength to scaling. Can I add a piece, a little bit, S last piece? Yes, so true. Absolutely, so true. And I think in the future what we will happen, uh, we will see a wider geographic coverage of biochar operations, uh, just trying to capture all the biomass sources that are scattered around the globe. So we will see that. So the industrial operations can be a different scale depending on the biomass uh, sourcing. And then new applications and new markets and new uses of biochar. And after COP, after the decision of COP, uh, I, I think that uh, the industries will be looking at uh, biochar as uh, for their decarbonizing activities to decarbonize uh, the activities and the products. Uh, so we will see a blossoming of uh, uh, products that will use biochar as binder, as in cement, in asphalt, in whatever. Uh, it's already there. It's already there and it is uh, happening. And of course, the soil is still an issue. To me, uh, what biochar is able to do in terms of food security for the planet is amazing. Building a bit on this discussion on, uh, on decentralization, we talked about carbon removal uh, that links to carbon credits, to certification, and to the ability to kind of monitor actually what is happening for real uh, on the climate impact, be it you know emission reductions or or, or uh, carbon removal. And here again, we get into this problem or you know strength maybe, <laughs> but of having multiple uh, very decentralized sources of carbon removal, uh, you know, each plant and each biochar application. And so maybe a question uh, for, uh, for, for you, Hans-Jörg, and then for, for everyone, but how do we ensure that we keep a high level of integrity that, you know, when biochar claims, you know, we remove carbon, carbon is indeed removed, how do we ensure that five years from now, we don't have a red plus scandal saying, well, actually all those fake uh, carbon removal that came from biochar, and how do you, we build, you know, measurability, trust that are needed to sustain the price of carbon credits, which is needed to sustain the growth of the industry? Yeah. Th th this is absolutely essential. It, it, it only works with trust, and, and trust is not compromitable. Uh, compro compro um, and uh, from my point of view, and, and for me also one of the, the, the key motivations to stay in this, uh, in this industry is that um, if, we, if we set up uh, a clear set of uh, reporting, monitoring, and verification systems, based on third-party independent certifications, and we have now a couple of, uh, of, uh, of certification systems in the market. Um, and on top of this, we need to build a, a clear uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification system in order to really make sure that one ton is just counted once and for sure not, not various times. And the only way to ensure that is to physically follow, digitally follow the carbon atoms from the production in the biochar producing unit to the carbon preserving applica uh, application. And this is the two things. Follow the carbon atoms through tracking 
And the second thing is ensuring through a fully digitalized process that um, that there's a closed line of contracts between the producer of the biochar and the end user. Only if you ensure that the, a trustable system can be made. Thanks. Pierre, how, how do you, with your kind of consulting hat and, you know, you're, you're pushing companies to decarbonize and to offset, how, how is this question of integrity uh, seen? It's it, one of the, of the trickiest one, I would say. One of the tough ones. Um, because we have seen the... Ah, sorry. No, that's okay. The, the more or less the scandals that happened with offsetting recently uh, with the red, so deforestation. Uh, two days ago, it was the same about cook stoves uh, in the Telegraph ag uh, again. Um, so one major difference uh, in those kind of offsets, we are speaking about counterfactual scenarios, so avoidance of emission. So you are always comparing yourself to a hypothetical baseline. And this is mainly this has hypothetical baseline that is challenged. Uh, in the recent, uh, let's say, backlash that we have on, on offsets. Uh, then, then the other issue is uh, what we call like double claiming or double counting. And effectively, to be sure how to assure that one ton of reduction is only claimed by one pr company user. Um, ideally, and I do like that, we should be able to trace everything. So it means really trace everything like, OK, we can have blockchain, and maybe those new technology will allow us to have this kind of traceability. That's OK. Traceability will come at a, at a cost. We need to also take that into account. So for now, there's this kind of intermediate, like we say, systems, like the, value ch the, the one that the value chain initiative is pushing, like uh, the concept of supply shed. You are insetting, you are introducing a, an improvement in your supply chain uh, where you, you know that you are sourcing and you do apply more or less, let's say, a ratio to uh, only take into account the part of the agriculture that do apply biochar on this field, for instance. But yeah, one of the trickiest questions that we do see with any chain of custody, I would say, and that's not only linked to biochar. When it comes to mass balance, to book and claim, to uh, sustainable aviation fuel, etc., that's a bigger problem. And, and I think that's one of the key challenges in all the environmental accounting that we are facing. Uh, may, uh, yes, for sure, trustability, uh, accounting, all, all of that is key. I think there is also um, an important uh, thing to, to have in mind, uh, probably it's my uh, industrial focus, but we can't make a distinction between the product itself and the way it is used to produce it. Meaning that you, we can't produce or advocate for a beautiful biochar. Is a production conditions are not also certified or also um, safe and environmentally friendly and so on. So I think in the future, in the next future, we, we need probably to jump to a kind of artisanal uh, perception of the biochar production to a more, let's say, industrial, safely secured and monitored industry. And I think we can di make a distinction between the credit carbons of that, which is the nice point, and the inevitable point in regard to climate change uh, mitigation, but also we have to be careful of this biochar has to be nicely produced. And I think it's probably one point on, we've, on which um, many of us should, uh, should take attention in the future. I, I agree with you, Dominique. Uh, sorry. I agree with you, Dominique, and, uh, and then I think that the trust wouldn't be linked only to certification, but also to the standardization of the quality of the brochure. Uh, when, Axel, you were asking what is the business model of tomorrow, is there one standardization? I don't think so. I think we need to tailor according to the needs. It could be the needs of availability of the feedstock. It could be the needs of um, using. Uh, so maybe you need to get a small machine to, to, to be able to move it, etc. So this should not be standardized. We should let the option come. But the quality needs to be standardized to first reassure the market, but to make sure that in 10 years there is no scandal on this one. Uh, but also, as you said at the beginning, Lucia, if we want to be able to put back with the co, for example, uh, the Bioshar, we need to make sure that this is certified for food application. And we don't want to take any risk that could kill the full industry. So for me, quality standardization is the key point. If I can add a piece. 
Uh, that's super important, and thank you. The, the systems to the monitoring MRV, it's super important. When you sell the, the, the credits that are generated uh, and the carbon sinks that are generated. But if you're not selling those credits, the only point is to have a safe uh, biosphere. So, uh, and that's important, that's key, because there are many operations, uh, especially in the global south, that they produce biochar in a very artisanal and perhaps kind of funky way, and, uh, but it, it works, uh, it works. So, and they are able to capture uh, all the benefits of this uh, technology and to use the biochar applied to their soil. So they're still doing something which is good, uh, but they're not participating to the global Thank you. We're going to open up for questions in a, in a few minutes, but I, I'd like maybe to, f to finish this. Uh, oh. Perhaps perhaps a breaking news for some of them, but, but we spoke about normalization, standardization. The good news is that the biochar is going to be normalized. There is an ESO initiative at world level uh, with uh, 14 countries participating. Canada is leading this initiative. France is part of that, but many countries are US also. And I think it will be key uh, to, to, to support that because without an ISO terminology, ISO standardization classification of the product, we, we will have to face some uh, misunderstanding, let's say, between the market and the producers and so on. We, we spell with two names something which is similar or with the same name something which can be very different. So this ISO is going to be on place. So there is an important meeting next week on that. Uh, France is participating actively on that. I'm part of the of, of the of the group, and uh, for me, we will focus on two two aspects as a much as a, let's say a priority. The first one is the terminology, the naming. We can't use the same name for depicting a different product provided they are black on powder. <laughs> it's not sufficient. For, and first point, and the second point is classification, meaning that we need to fix some uh, very small series of criteria, three of them should be sufficient, plus one or two uh, concerning the granulometry or the size distribution and things like that. And it should be sufficient to make some classes. And these classes will help the market to understand what is produced, what can be used. And the next step, of course, of normalization or specification will be the usage. Because defining the class of a product is one point. but making the link between this class, minimal class uh, classification of a product and the usage would be something probably more tricky, but we have to, to go in this direction. But first of all, we have to, uh, to use the same term terminology and the same classification. It, it will be done probably in the next month. Good news. Yeah, very, very good news. Uh, actually, that's a good transition with, uh, you know, what was my kind of last question for, for each of you. Uh, we, we see, you know, this huge potential, this huge growth expected. A number of things need to happen. And you just mentioned, you know, normalization. This is one. If you had a magic wand, each of you, what would be the one thing that you would do, you would use it for, so that basically we can unlock the potential of biochar? Um, you know, could be things around regulation, technology, <laughs> usages, whatever. Uh, what, what is needed, you know, in a more serious way, what is needed to really move to something that can scale? What are the barriers that we would like to, to be seen removed, either by the industry or by regulators or by, by others? And I don't know, with no specific order, but maybe starting with you, Lucia. Yes, thank you. Uh, I mean, to, uh, there are several uh, things that come. We, we should be relatively quick so yeah. that then. So it's education to me, it's key. It has been already mentioned, especially educating the market. Uh, and that's something that needs to be in place and quickly uh, so that we can expand uh, the use uh, of biochar. And that's, uh, I think it's key. And there's another point uh, to me. Uh, I think we need to um, also to work on the ecosystems around the biochar operations and the industry. Because, I mean, uh, when it turns out, OK, carbon taxes, stuff like that, that the governments are uh, going to apply. I was told that in Indonesia, the, the, the ministry is going to think about a tax of 40% on uh, biochar carbon removal credits. So, I mean, it's it's something that can prevent uh, biochar operation. So we need to also to work and to address the ecosystem so that it can be, uh, I mean, facilitating, enabling uh, biochar operation. 
Dominique, you already had a wish, but you have a second yeah, one. You're second lucky. One, yes. Uh, education is key and gathering information and um, and return of experience. Uh, so I'm very pleased to, to be part of a, of a new working group in France, which is named the Groupe de Travail Biochar, which is led by uh, Piro Gasification Club of ATE. And um, I think typically putting together the information to bring safety, to bring awareness, to bring uh, let's say the return of experience of usage of biochar will be will be key so gathering information sharing experience for me it would be very uh in, in, inevitable in the next uh, in the next years to 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 go back to the, to the market so i'll be really brief um my my wish uh, would be a carbon credit price of 250 euros um, and i do believe that this is totally adequate when you look at the building sector the building sector if you do a, a, a carbon uh, emission reduction measure in a building, the, the average price is in the range of 250, 200 to 250 uh, euros. And when we look, and we'll hear uh, later on a discussion on permanence, biochar is as permanent as uh, the, the, the CO2 uh, storage. So there's no point why to pay a lower price for car uh, biochar carbon removal credits than for uh, geological CO2 storage. So simple 250 euros and the industry will scale fast enough that will in that will create the 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 kick for the scaling thank you uh, i think we mentioned a uh, lot of my wish already we talked about the competition in the feedstock we talked about the um, economic viability to prove uh, which is a, a big challenge for us uh, within 2024 already but i think that if i have to you know keep one wish, it will be awareness on education, as you mentioned, uh, because sometimes it's even worse than what we thought. Uh, when we talk about biochar, we talk even about carbon, and sometimes it's not even, even about awareness on biochar, but even on carbon. When you talk to people that vote the law, for example, because we are talking about that, uh, carbon, they think this is the disaster of the 21 centuries. Uh, they, they think that carbon is something awful. So if you want to say that you put carbon into the soil, they think that you will destroy the planet and then it will explode. So it's a bit not reassuring to say that. Um, so this is why I think awareness is important on the political uh, side, but also on the farmers, because of course, this is the, you know, uh, sometimes they don't have even the money, the cash flow uh, to buy the biochar before the harvest. So for them, the soil is so important that they don't want to destroy it. So we want to build trust. And this is why at Nespresso, for example, uh, we will normally launch uh, two pilot projects in 2024, one I hope is a net zero, uh, to be able to prove to the farmer that this is working, this is helping their living income, but also the nature. Thanks. Okay, I will try to finish. Um, I will be, maybe I'm a dreamer, uh, Elton John-like uh, dreamer, but my, my, I think the ultimate goal is to basically reduce GHG emission. And for that, we need a proper price. And to have a proper price, we need also company maybe to pay a proper price for their emission. And I think that's one of the key levels here to put a good price depending on the company, where you are, what you are doing on your emission. And depending on that, maybe you can have more money to reduce them. Great. Uh, I'm going to have a wish, too, because there's no reason. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, linked to what uh, Hans Jörg was, was mentioning, um, we need a clarification on the rules for, you know, carbon removal, the regulation, what, you know, what are going to be the international rules, what are going to be the regional rules, uh, how is th this thing going to be taxed, uh, how companies will be at some point forced to integrate carbon removal in their roadmaps. Today, I think there's a lot of investment that would like to move into biochar and maybe other carbon removal uh, solutions, but it's still too foggy, you know. And in front of foggy situations, the investors say, okay, wait and see. And every year we lose, we lose big time on the hundreds of millions or gigatons that we need to remove you know, in 2040 and 2050. So I think a very quick clarification of rules is, is much needed. It's, you know, there are a few things on the table in Europe. Uh, Dominique, you mentioned you know, a, a number of, uh, of things, but the clearer the rules, even if they are not perfect, but if they are clear and stable, that will help you know, funnel actually a lot of money that is waiting to move to, 
to the biochar industry. So thank you for to the panelists. Now we're going to open to uh, to the room. I guess there's a microphone somewhere, um, and so we're going to. No, there's no mic. Take one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Maybe two. We take the six. Thank you. So you can ask your question in French or in English. I think there's translation, but you need to to let us to let the engineer the technicians know so that we can uh, we can switch. Yes, English. It's okay. Uh, my name is Victor. I'm from the Green Acre Furnace. Um, positive way of um, thanking you for this uh, stand-up comedian thing, what you said, because um, we haven't learned nothing. It's like we heard the words from 2022, 2023. We're sitting here with six people mentioning things which we heard two or three years ago as well. Nothing news has been said. Uh, all the people, big companies, saying, yes, we did in the past, we did do, we hope this, we think like this, no risk. Why? You are brilliant people. Um, I think Lucia said something that biochar can um, clear water. No. Activated charcoal can clear water. Biochar, biomass cannot clear water. So I'm very surprised that the Bio360 is choosing year and year again for a panel with people saying things we already know. So what's, what's your question? So my question is, what's, what's, the news you're, what's the news you're bringing us? And for Lucia, how with biochar can you clean water? And for Suez, what are really your, aim, your goals? What do you really want? Um, cut off. So, 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 so tell us something. OK. Tell us something new. This is, this is, this is like a, a stand-up funny thing, eh? all positive. Eh? But what have we learned now from numbers, no risk, et cetera, et cetera? So that's my question is, what are your new ideas? Eh? We with the Green Echo Ferns, we make the difference. We have no pollution, we have no emission, but this is all blah, 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 with all respect. So that's my question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, especially because you are leading this. And uh, I think uh, you should read a lot of papers that are published on wastewater treatments and uh, filtration and uh, how biochar can help in that. So that's my point. And I'm happy that despite the fact that we were not able to deliver the message that you were expecting, you're still here. And, and sir, we, we, are, we are just facing a new industry and any new industry will not come from one day to another, you know? So for Suez, for example, five years ago, we didn't imagine that biochar industry could be part of our business. And now we are just building a factory and we are planning to build many others. S and we are investing in R&D to prove what you said. So the time is there, you know. OK. Other question? Hello, uh, I'm Jan Mercier from Terawatt. And Dominique has mentioned that there are three incomes possible from biochar, which is one biochar, the other one is carbon credit. And in Terawatt, maybe I uh, will give an instrument to this, to this man to apport a new thing. Uh, in Terawatt, we are working on turning syngas into biomethane uh, with bacteria, which is bi biological biomethanation. Do you think it's a solution that can be installed in many places in the world, or we will be too far away from uh, um, biomethane conception centers? And what is your view, or have you thought about this, this point? Anyone? Anyone? Me as well. OK. Um, you're, uh, 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 Let's imagine what, what is the base, uh, the smart uh, location for building a plant. You need biomass. We need uh, clients for biochar, of course. We will not transport the biomass, the biochar, every, everywhere in the world. And we need also a smart output for the energy. So these constraints will define afterwards the, 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 the situation you, you mentioned. Because, of course, as a producer of biochar, we will find the best way to manage this uh, syngas to provide value, but with a smaller capex and smaller risk and things like that. Turning back to biomethane needs to have uh, an access to the grid, 
and the grid usually is not there when we produce biochar because we are very close to, to, to the plant. So, but for sure, the syngas recovery into value is also uh, a field of innovation which is very great. And many people here are working on that. The first thing, the most easy is to produce heat. Uh, a bit uh, more harder is to produce steam or to produce electricity. And the last point would be to produce chemicals and probably biofuels for sure. But, um, you know, the difficulty of the business is such large today that we have to, to find, uh, let's say, sweet points uh, with easy capex, easy solution, and easy contracts also in order to provide value on the long term. Yeah, just two more comments. Uh, one on this question, which is clearly, this is exactly the variety of technology solutions we need. There is not one solution. There are different circumstances, different biomasses, different infrastructure, and therefore this is a, this might be a very very interesting solution. But I would also like to make one comment to uh, uh, to, to to your to your statement, which is I mean I when when I was a young guy uh, start g get entering into the uh, solar space, solar energy was just marginal. It was when I started a company back in 2005. We thought at that time that we, we, we're great, we're already doing some sort of things. Now, then I started the company and seven years later, the price, the market price had fallen from six euro to one euro 30 or so. Um, and, and that is the dynamics we currently see. So I, I, I like you being impatient. I'm also very, very impatient. It does not go fast enough for me, but you, we clearly see that there is a very, very strong market development and the market growth of 68% is really impressive. Now we just need to keep up the growth rates and then we'll see the impact not in one year, not in two years, but in five to 10 years, we'll turn it and clearly biochar carbon removal, it has been said, is, is the most relevant permanent carbon removal technology we have today on Earth. We might wish others, great. We need to, 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 to kick for other uh, 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 solutions as well, but, but w we have to be impatient and push for higher growth rates. Uh, yes, hi, thank you. Uh, we are a biochar producer and we actually make a water filtration product from rice hulls, so, and we've been selling it for several years, trying to get Suez to buy it. Um, we're still in test with you guys, but hopefully that will continue. Um, but uh, I appreciate everything that you guys have said. Uh, I also am pretty impatient and trying to get this going because we've been doing this now for about four years and uh, we thought it would be a lot faster. The biggest issue we face right now though is uh, really two things. One, funding because finding the capital to support this uh, has been very tough because most of the traditional folks who are used to the solar or wind model are looking for offtakes for the biochar, which isn't really a thing. Um, although, hey, you know, you guys could solve that problem. Um, and, and number two, um, the other thing they're looking for are offtakes for or pre purchases, which could help with uh, non dilutive funding for companies like. Uh, like ours, uh, from the pre-purchase of carbon credits. But uh, after the Guardian article, that whole market sort of dried up. But if you're looking for carbon credits to be there in the future at whatever price, I, I, I hope you're right about the 250. That would make life wonderful. Although I, I sense from Microsoft and others that that price is closer to between 100 and 150 for very large numbers going forward. But I hope you're right, because that would make the economics a lot better. So the question really to, to you guys is, for pre-purchase of carbon credits, and this really is for you know the, the, the corporate guys, Suez and, and Nespresso, um, what is your thought on stepping into the market to support it through the pre-purchase or an offtake agreement, large offtake agreements for carbon credits? 
I, I, I would say, and I hope it will answer to your question, but uh, I, I would say that I agree with you. Uh, financing could be difficult, and uh, many in biochar. Part of my job is working on innovation, but uh, the other part is working on co-financing on all the projects we are trying to put in place. Uh, maybe to explain why, it's because um, all the AAA farmers we are working with, they are, as they are not Nespresso, maybe they could sell 5, 10, 20 percent only to Nespresso, and the rest would go to other customers. So that's why when there are this kind of projects, uh, you know, we want to finance, but we cannot be the only one changing the full supply chain. And you're right that when we're bringing all the projects, you know, the, to the co-financer, external financer, World Bank, and uh, and this kind of organism, the Bioshar is not the one really ringing, you know, at the bell because this is also for communication purpose. Uh, they, they they want also the customer to understand what we are doing. And as we say before, awareness not being there or education not being there enough, uh, they don't think it will speak uh, to their investors, etc. So. Awareness, I think, will really uh, play a role there. I'm sorry, then on this one, it will take time. I know that. I'm spending a lot of time trying to explain and to uh, democratize, let's say, uh, biochar. Uh, but then it will come in the future. I'm, I'm sure about that. And then the second part uh, on the uh, prepayment, this is a bit what we are trying to do with some projects. So we cannot finance all the biochar machine for sure in the world. Uh, but why you say? <laughs> uh, maybe then we should uh, stop making coffee. Uh, uh, but then this is what we want to do, for example, with net zero, uh, to say, OK, we want to prove to the farmer that this is working. We know that uh, we need investment up front. And then we will uh, try to participate to this kind of um, uh, machine construction or factory construction in exchange of carbon credit pay prepayment. So we are exactly going in the direction you are describing. But I if I may, I, I think you touch an important point around, you know, the visibility on, you know, future cash flows. Offtake of biochar is tricky. I mean, there are some places where you can do it, but generally speaking, it's tricky. Offtake of carbon credits, there are some contracts, uh, but today they are very low price. And it's very low price without getting the money. It's just a future buying uh, you know, you mentioned the Microsofts and, and, and so on. Uh, it's not cash immediately. It's okay, we will pay you based on some future volumes. So this is helping a bit the industry, but there's a, it's true that there's a huge lack of financing. Um, you know, it's still an industry of relatively small players. Um, you know, you have the big guys here, but you know, uh, if you look at even the, the ones like uh, here in the with Booth, um, and and financing is tricky uh, because of the uncertainty, because there's no carbon markets, there's no future contract, there's no all the kind of financing mechanism that exists for uh, commodities, and because there's this regulatory, um, you know, uncertainty, and so a lot of companies are still holding on. Say, okay, you know, we hear good things and bad things about carbon removal. Uh, it's not clear what will be allowed in the future. Wait and see. This plus the economic difficulty of all the investment sector because of the high interest rates and so on. It's true that it's a, we are a bit at a paradoxical time where it would be the time where big money starts to move in. And actually, it's not moving in or not moving in fast enough. And you're right, I said that when we are doing that as Nespresso, for example, we still have to you know, spend uh, I think more than a year to convince internally, because you, we do know that when we are asking for this money internally, it's taking a risk. It's not like just prepayments, uh, and then we will get the carbon credit. Project could not work, certification could not happen, uh, farmers could not use the biochar, and as we say, uh, to count, it needs to be applied properly in the right soil. So. We know also that when we are doing that, we cannot put huge amount of money in something that is not standard as yet. So we are okay to take the risk. We want to be leader here, uh, but this is what is blocking probably other company. Okay, next question. Ah, okay, yes. Hi, uh, Jerome here from Healthier Health. Um, I, you've been talking about carbon credits and uh, it's, it's related finance. Biochar, we, like, to get biochar, you need to get biochar in the soil. You need to get, and at the minute, you need to bring it to your to your farmers. Very high to high topic at the minute in France and the farmers. But like, what is the optimal pr price per ton for biochar? Do you think it'll be taken out because there's a market? We need to give it. Farmer will buy it, or are they? Are do we incentive? What is the optimal price for a ton of biochar generally in Europe? 
who you think would be? I mean, the, 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 it's a very difficult question, and the because the the use cases, the the production concepts are totally different. So I've seen concepts where the biochar can be on a on a on a really functioning financial model be given for free to the farmer. Um, but there are obviously, and and this, but this depends on on labor prices, on uh, on the feedstock used, on the value of the energy. I mean, it's a complex, it's a very complex uh, equation. To simplify the the equation, you have around four key metrics on the cost side. That is height of the investment, cost or negative cost of the biomass, operation and maintenance, and and uh, and then you have crowns. This is kind of the cost side. And on the revenue side, you have the carbon credit, you have the biochar as a material, and you have the energy. And and therefore, the, the there is no answer to that question. But I've seen business models which um, which can provide biochar at very very low cost at the factory gate, but also others where the the val there are high value biochar materials with certain special properties which uh, where you find customers that pay 800 euros for that if i can add a piece uh, of course uh, the voluntary carbon markets are markets so the price is decided as market decides the price uh, but we do have uh, the latest report from uh, uh, cdr fii uh, which was produced for the swedish energy agency, where they are uh, competing and checking all the costs of the different approaches. And as for biochar, uh, in, let's say, 2019-2023, um, uh, just considering this uh, um, time scale, uh, the lowest price uh, is uh, 97, I guess it's dollars. The highest price is 600, and the average uh, is one. 193 just to give you an idea but I, I think lucia what you're giving is the price of the carbon credits the question was yes. on the price of, of biochar oh, sorry. sorry and sorry. the the, yeah. the I mean, price of biochar uh, you know it's it's super local um so they i, I doubt there will be hopefully one day a global price for carbon removal you know and for biochar with you know there will always be differences because of co-benefits because of characteristics of biochar but we can have imagine having one price or one set of price locally the biochar as a product will be so dependent that you know anywhere from zero to one thousand what we know is that when you get close to 1,000, it doesn't make any sense from an economic standpoint for agriculture, but there are some other applications. And the lower you get, uh, or the closer you get to zero, the better it is uh, for farmers. It's also very different if you're, you're in Europe or in developing countries and so on and so forth. You know, in, in our case, we sell the biochar for, you know, a bit more than uh, 150 per ton in Cameroon, you know, and, you know, three times that in, in Brazil. And in Europe, it's, you know, very often, you know, 600, 800 plus. So long answer to, you know, there's no price. Thanks a lot. The following uh, conference will start soon. So we, we have another five minutes, I think. So maybe time for one more question. No, sorry. <laughs> it's starting at 40. Ah, OK. So we have to stop. So <laughs> sorry. Sorry. So I'd like to, to thank uh, well all the, all the panelists. Maybe add a, a last note, you know, a bit building on the comments of uh, the, the, the beginning of the, the questions. What has changed? I think three years ago, you would not have seen large companies starting to seriously consider biochar. I think three years ago, uh, the idea of really building carbon credits as the basis for high cost, high price carbon credits for the basis of biochar was kind of just beginning to float. But a lot of people were doubting about it. And so, I think, yes, things are changing slowly, but I think today, you know, the fact that big consulting companies, you know, big FMCGs, uh, big industry players, of course, startups, all supported by, you know, industry uh, bodies and associations, 
I think that's, that's a change compared to three years ago. It's not going fast enough, but indeed things are moving and you know, we need to go to the Gigaton. That was the theme of, uh, of today's panel. Um, you know, it's a huge challenge. Not sure we're going to get it, but you know, I think we're at least unlocking a number of things uh, to, to move in the right direction and keep the speed 46% per year. Remember that very few industries can claim that over, you know, 10, 20, 30 year uh, going forward. Thank you for your attention.